Hi, I'm Jeff. I'm the Director of Technology and Digital Initiatives at Vizcaya Museum and Gardens. And um, today we're, we've got a real exciting conversation. It's going to be with our former conservative conservator, Lauren Hall. Um, she has tackled some really complex issues at Vizcaya, uh, conservation-wise, and uh, she's going to give us the benefit of her perspective. Um, she is actually um, currently a uh, conservator with the U.S. State Department, uh, the Bureau of Overseas Building uh, Operations, the Office of Cultural Heritage. So, uh, Lauren, uh, tell us a little bit about what you're doing in your current role. Well, first, hi, Jeff. It's great to see you, and thank you so much for inviting me to participate in uh, this conversation today. I miss Vizcaya tremendously. Um, about a year and a half ago, I relocated from Miami to the Washington, D.C. area to work with uh, the Department of State. As Jeff said, I'm at the, the Bureau of Overseas Buildings Operations, and my office within the Bureau manages all of the department's overseas uh, historic assets. So that includes um, buildings as well as collections. And I'm, I'm the one and only conservator. So working with a wonderful team of people to, to manage and um, uh, manage a stewardship program for those collections. Awesome. And um, you know, you are beloved here at Vizcaya. We really <laughs> you. Uh, you did Aww. such a great job while you were here. Um, so I said, we're Thank gonna you. focus on uh, talking about the history of the swimming pool grotto, which has been probably one of the most um, difficult projects or complex projects that you you had to deal with while you were at Vizcaya. We actually do have uh, what we're calling the pool cam, um, which is, um, you know, we, our digital communications manager, Alex Cerna, is broadcasting live from the swimming pool grotto. So it's a view that not many people get. It's not open to the public currently, but um, she's actually going to be um, giving us a tour of the space as we talk and pointing out things as Lauren brings them up, um, you know, pointing to those areas. So uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, so uh, Lauren, let's just start with a little bit of the history of the grotto. Uh, tell us, um, you know, what was involved in the development, the planning of it, and also the construction, and then we'll go into the conservation issues too. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and this this was absolutely one of my most favorite spaces and one of my most challenging projects when I was at Vizcaya. Um, I was there from about uh, 2014 to 2019 and um, worked as a, a consultant uh, with Rosa Lowinger and Associates before that. So I've spent a lot of time at Vizcaya and a lot of time thinking specifically about this space. Uh, in terms of its history, Grottoes, just to talk a little bit about a historic precedent, um, grottoes, the concept of the grotto is a, a 17th, 18th century concept that came from continental Europe, um, much like much of Vizcaya was informed by a European precedent, so was this space. And the grotto is highly decorative. Um, it features an indoor-outdoor swimming pool. And uh, the space was essentially conceived of as a part of the original design of the house, but was later embellished by this um, tremendous ornamental mural, ceiling mural, with uh, high relief shell clusters and uh, fish in this swirling watery vortex. So we'll talk a little bit about the designers in a minute, but just uh, here's a historic image of the space. The designs for Vizcaya were completed around 1914, and the building, the house, the main house, was completed in 1916. And this space sort of evolved over that time and um, was completed in 1916 as well, with the ceiling being completed in early 1917, according to records in Vizcaya's archive. And it's, it's truly um, an immersive space. The space is intended to sort of make the visitor feel as though they've been submerged in water uh, between the reflection of the, the ceiling on the pool water below and then the ceiling itself being a scene of um, sort of this underwater, as we said, this watery vortex of all of these um, fish and marine life and marine plants and shells and all kinds of funky little critters. So, um, if we can go, Jeff, maybe to the picture of the two 
yeah. gentleman responsible for the design of the space. I think that's next up. So the space, uh, as much of Vizcaya was, was conceived of by Paul Chalfin, uh, who was Vizcaya's artistic director. He's responsible for many of those very ornamented finishes you see all around Vizcaya. And uh, the design of the space was quite neoclassical and symmetrical. And then he adorned the walls with those beautiful um, applied shells in this sort of mosaic pattern. And the grotto was, was replete with this beautiful marble floor and these uh, custom designed wall sconces that uh, cast shadows onto this, uh, onto this very decorative floor. There were wall fountains. And so you really had um, all senses engaged in the space. Um, maybe we can, we can take a look at the space too. Um, and so you were hearing water, you were seeing water, you were feeling sort of the cool mist uh, coming from the fountains as well as the breezes from the bay. This space is only about, I would say, um, 50 or 60 feet from Biscayne Bay. And so the, the space was designed in advance of the installation of the ceiling mural on the space, as I said, was the responsibility of Chalfin, Paul Chalfin. And then uh, Robert Winthrop Chandler was the artist commissioned to do the ceiling mural. And he was a very um, popular decorative artist at the, the early 20th century period, well connected in New York, and also kind of, kind of a wild man. He was a really uh, dynamic character and his reputation preceded him uh, in many ways. And, and he came up with this concept of this swirling water, watery underwater scene. And uh, he cast all of those uh, relief elements that have been applied to the ceiling in his New York studio and shipped them down in crates in advance of their installation once this space had, had sort of come together. And uh, so he's, he's the artistic mind behind this incredibly decorative ceiling. So the, there's the, the beauty of the space. Obviously, it's very, very unique and interesting, but, um, you know, Though the artist did a great job in, in bringing the vision to life, um, it's been um, a chore. It's been required a lot of expertise to uh, keep it preserved and conserved so that our future generations can enjoy it. Can you talk a little bit about some of the projects that you've worked on in the conservation of that space? Absolutely. The, the whole space uh, presents a challenge, but uh, the, the ceiling mural in particular. And Chalfin um, was really, most of the work that he had done had been for interior spaces. So designing something that was for a, a partially exterior environment was not something that uh, he had done previously. And uh, the materials that he chose inadvertently, I believe, ended up being quite sensitive to their environment, so to, to the moisture in the environment in particular. So as most folks in Miami can appreciate, the humidity in this space remains at a, at a really high level. And uh, that's only exacerbated by the fact that this, this ceiling is installed over a swimming pool. And then you also had these um, jets of water shooting into the air from the various fountains installed in the space. So um, it was, again, quite, quite high humidity. And we have some records in the archive, a letter, in fact, that would suggest that within a year or two, the paint had already started to fail on the ceiling. And a series of analyses that we, we conducted back in uh, 2014 and all the way up through current um, most recently in January was the follow-up investigation. Um, we've, we've divided the project for the mural into three phases. The first phase being a documentation phase where we were really trying to understand the full scope of conditions as well as uh, the materials and their behavior in that environment. So we were doing a lot of documenting of condition as well as characterization of the materials. And we found through a series of investigations that involved a number of very talented conservators um, that Chandler's original paint is a distemper paint, which happens to be somewhat moisture sensitive. 
Uh, and he also used a gypsum plaster, again, which exhibits some moisture sensitivity. So real challenges in terms of keeping that paint well adhered to the surface. And um, through a series of uh, cross-sectional analyses, which involves taking tiny, tiny samples of the paint and embedding them in a little cube of resin and sectioning that resin and polishing it up so that you can see the layers of paint on their substrate under uh, a microscope, uh, revealed that he had used um, aluminum leaf on a lot of the fish. So you had this um, reflective quality to a number of the fish on the ceiling. And we also learned that the, the palette was quite different than what's exhibited now. So Chandler had used uh, some really deep blues and greens, some really acid colored um, yellows, some ochres, a lot of coral and, and ultramarine blue. And um, unfortunately, a lot of those colors have been lost due to a series of overpaint campaigns that have made the ceiling look more pastel and muted in terms of its palette. But as you might imagine, in addition to um, all the plaster and paint that's been applied to the ceiling, uh, Chandler also applied shells. So there's there are shell appliques on the, the pendant, those triangular panels. Um, Alex can show us a little bit there. You can see around the perimeter of this triangular panel and then um, sort of to complement what was happening on the walls of the space. So the other surfaces within the space are also challenged by the environment, as you might imagine, um, but not to the same degree as the, as the ceiling mural. So that has been the focus of, of some pretty dedicated study over the past several years, which uh, has been tremendously productive and tremendously enlightening in terms of how the ceiling was one constructed and how its condition has essentially devolved uh, considering this space. So uh, Lauren, tell us a little bit, bit about some of those partnerships. University of Pennsylvania has been a great partner in our conservation efforts. Absolutely, yes. Uh, I, I have worked with um, several folks from the University of Pennsylvania um, through the years to do a series of studies. Our first with them included a, a full-scale conditions assessment by a thesis student working with Cassie Myers, um, who is a mural conservator in Philadelphia and also an instructor in the Penn Program for Historic Preservation and, and Architectural Conservation. And uh, they've also done a series of environmental studies for us and help us helped Vizcaya come up with um, some paths forward in terms of managing that really challenging environment. But I should, I should there are many shout outs. Um, we worked initially with um, Susan Buck for a lot of the paint analysis, and she came to Vizcaya twice to do a, a secondary follow-up analysis in January of 2018, I believe it was. Um, Chris Mills did uh, some initial investigations which involved removal of some of that overpaint, um, which is really tenacious and oil-based, whereas the original finishes are, um, are pro-tenacious and, and water-based. And um, so he was really instrumental in revealing some of, some of that underlying work of, of the artists. Um, we worked with uh, an advisory team at the very outset of the project, which involved Frank Matero, who is the chair of the Historic Preservation Program at Penn, as well as Mark Rabinowitz um, and Lauren Droppola. And then moving, moving forward, um, we have worked with E2 Chem. Uh, they've done a structural investigation of what's happening above the ceiling. And some of that, um, that structure was actually treated in 2015 and stabilized. And then most recently, we've been working with Emily McDonald Korth, which you can see here on the left. She's stabilizing some of that surface paint. And Cassie Myers has been back on a number of occasions to establish treatment protocols for now that we, we have a really good handle on what's happening with the materiality of the paint, uh, what are we going to do in terms of uh, stabilizing the ceiling and then essentially restoring it aesthetically, visually? Um, how do you make it? How do you make it more legible? How do you conserve it? So, so, so she and Emily have established some treatment protocols that have been implemented 
um, in a testing phase over the past, I would say, probably nine months. And then um, moving forward, that will be implemented on a, a, a broader section of the ceiling, most likely like a, a quarter of the ceiling, which would eventually be viewable from the cafe and shop once it's reopened. And then that lower terrace uh, adjacent to the pool on the, um, I think it's the west side of the pool. And then from there on, we would move to a, a broader effort, which would really um, stabilize the, the remainder of the ceiling as well as incorporate uh, incorporate it aesthetically so that we can fill in some of those white areas of loss. Awesome. That's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. It's, yeah, it's a mouthful. Sorry about that. No, that's great. Um, well, it, and there's another part of the story in 2017, uh, you and I kind of uh, partnered to do laser scanning of the space, 3D documentation. So laser scanning and a photogrammetry uh, to help, you know, uh, to help get a picture of what the space looks like right now and to inform future conservation efforts. You want to talk a little bit about the importance of that? Absolutely. So the University of Florida has been a tremendous partner for Vizcaya. They've documented several spaces um, that are currently inaccessible to the public, um, or at least in part. Um, and that's that's been a really high priority from a conservation perspective because documentation not only establishes uh, current condition, but it also gives you sort of a baseline from which you can measure future degradation. And so that was that was my priority in terms of um, working with them in the grotto space. And then also this whole question of accessibility, the fact that the grotto has only up until um, up until Hurricane Irma in 2017, the grotto was open for um, small special events and select tours, which Vizcaya would like to continue in the future. Um, but for the most part, it is largely inaccessible to the broad, broader audience uh, that comes to visit Vizcaya. So Jeff, maybe you can talk a little bit about how they're able to, how they're able to access the space virtually. Right, so yeah, as uh, we said, this project took place in uh, 2017. Um, it was initially you know, uh, laser scanning, 3D documentation, photogrammetry has been, you know, established as a viable tool for preservation, you know, for at least the last decade. And um, the technology has come a long way. Uh, something that had not been done that much was actually taking these preservation uh, point clouds, which are not truly like 3D models in the sense that the public thinks about, and making those accessible to the public so that they can manipulate them, they can experience it like they're actually at that site. And uh, we did this with both our, our barge and also the swimming pool grotto. Basically just mapping the surface of the space with lasers, which it can record to uh, the detail of a micron. So we wanted to do it for preservation. We knew that we were overdue for um, you know, a major hurricane, it had been a decade since we'd seen one, and we wanted to document our most vulnerable spaces. Uh, but an opportunity came up from the, uh, the Knight Foundation to actually do projects, digital projects, for public accessibility. And what we endeavored to do was to create 3D models that the public could access. So be able to go into the grotto and uh, experience it virtually. And uh, we were able to do that. We've got it available um, as a large screen kiosk in the museum. But we've also got a website that's dedicated to that where you can experience those models, a little lower resolution, but it's called virtualviscaya.org. So here's a screenshot of it. You can get into the space. You can learn more about 3D documentation. You can um, actually you know, click on the swimming pool grotto experience. It will take you into uh, an immersive experience. Uh, in which you are actually in the swimming pool grotto, can get close up with some of the artistic detail there and uh, play around with it. We've also got bits of text interpretation to go along with it so we, uh, you know what you're looking at. It's a project that's been very successful and as Lauren said, we're continuing to do 3D documentation on the estate. We've documented the Vizcaya Village, we've documented the Garden Mound, and you know, we intend to do the main house at some point. So eventually we can create models based on 
everything that we've done that we've documented with 3D documentation. At the same time, we're preserving um, the space and informing our conservation practice too. So virtualvisky.org, encourage you to check it out. There's also an option for using uh, Google Cardboard to actually uh, use the goggles and immerse yourself in that space. I uh, hope you'll check it out. One thing that's so exciting about those scans is the level of detail they're able to capture. So once you enter the site, you're really able to zoom in and see uh, just the level of detail and the level of um, ornamentation that that uh, that was applied to the ceiling, I should say. And the other helpful thing about laser scanning was that we were able to uh, we'll be able to reproduce elements that have been lost, three-dimensional elements that have been lost using that data since some of the, those um, applied, some of that applied decoration repeats. Indeed. So, you know, whereas this has been a challenging space for it, it's provided us um, real opportunity to connect with the public through our conservation efforts. And um, in that way, we're very grateful for those challenges. We can share them with you. So for the next part of our conversation, we're going to do a little bit of Q&A. We've gotten some uh, questions on social media from folks that uh, have specific questions about this from Fulbrado. Feel free if you're on Facebook Live or uh, on YouTube to uh, share your questions and we'll try to get to them. So one of the first ones we uh, had was, how deep is the pool? And uh, the answer, it's three feet on the shallow end, it's eight feet on the deep end. But, um, that's from Travel Teaser on Instagram. Uh, second question, what's behind the door? There's a door in the, in the, uh, the grotto, what's behind there? That's well, more. there's two, there's two doors and actually I see our pool cam has frozen. So Jeff, maybe you can go back to one of those historic images so we can, we can show people which doors we're talking about. Uh, but there's two doors into the space. And as I mentioned, the space is really um, symmetrical. So there's one door into the grotto space from the museum and shop area, which is the door that you can see here. Uh, well, the two, the two doors at the front of this image with the bench in front of it, those go into the cafe, what is now the cafe and shop, which, which was historically the recreational spaces in Vizcaya. The door on the adjacent wall uh, is the door that goes into that space. So you would be in sort of the restroom area. Um, those were historically the changing rooms. And then the door to uh, James Deering's elevator was just inside that door. And then there's a door on the other side of that wall that um, mirrors this arched door here. And that was a fake door. Uh, again, just for, for maintaining symmetry in the space. And this is a theme we see elsewhere at Vizcaya in order to maintain that symmetry. So it's a, it's a, it's a door to nowhere. All right. Yeah. Uh, so the next question from Jennifer on Instagram is, why not restore it and allow public access? So Vizcaya is in the process of, of restoring this space. Um, as I'm sure many of you can appreciate, Vizcaya has many needs and many challenges. Um, and that has, I would imagine, although I'm not there anymore, uh, I would imagine that that has been somewhat exacerbated by our current circumstances with um, the pandemic. But uh, this is a really complicated space and it's a really special space. It's also a really um, fragile space. So uh, there are absolutely plans to move forward with uh, conservation, which include addressing the ceiling, but also the remainder of the space. The floor has already been um, restored and uh, the ceiling is well on its way in terms of all that has been learned about it and all that is planned for it. Um, I just want to check my notes here. Uh, the plan this year is to install an environmental monitoring system for that space. And recently, through a grant from the State of Florida Division of Emergency Management, this guy was able to, uh, will be able to move forward with a dam that will protect, I, I'm sure, more than just the north side of the house, but um, other aspects of the property from storm surge, which is so 
prevalent during hurricanes, whether or not the hurricane is a direct hit to Miami or not. Um, there have been some serious challenges with storm surge, and the grotto is certainly uh, a space that is affected by those. So thinking about preserving the space and protecting it in um, future storms is important. So that's moving forward. And um, once the cafe and shop are open, there will be increased uh, opportunities for tours, increased interpretation, and um, certainly a priority is, is to reestablish guided access to the space. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that there will ever be an opportunity just because of access um, and logistical challenges with where the grotto is located in the house for it to be um, fully open to the public, like, like on a self-guided tour but absolutely um, guided access to the space is a high priority. And um, there are many, as I mentioned, many needs at Vizcaya. So uh, two other recommendations that came out of the most recent study um, were to move forward with a pilot program, as I said, to restore the ceiling, which would involve approximately 20% initially gauging how that fares over time and then continuing with the remainder of the ceiling. Um, but that, that's an investment, and um, so Vizcaya is actively seeking ways to fund that work, as well as cathodic protection of the structural steel elements above that ceiling, which I mentioned earlier. Um, so cathodic protection is an electrochemical uh, means of essentially preferentially corroding another metal and preserving the structure. Um, but that is a, a massive endeavor and a massively expensive endeavor. So all of these things take time in terms of study and they take money in terms of um, sort of the practical implication of them. But rest assured, Vizcaya is working hard at it. Indeed. So we've got um, a question on YouTube uh, from Patrick. It says, hello, Lauren, you mentioned the fountains in the grotto space were jets. Did these rise from the basins along the wall as they do down either side of the entrance drive? Actually, that's, that's an excellent question. So there are two fountains on the east wall of the grotto. I don't know that we have a picture of that, and I'm not sure our pool cam is still live, but um, these were not uh, jets that, I, maybe that was a little bit um, of an exaggeration, but the, the spouts did project water up into those little bubbling. Oh, here we go. You can see it there on the left, on the image on the left. Um, so the, the wall fountains, the grotto wall fountains did have little jets that bubbled up. And then you can see um, in between the two staircases that lead down into the water, um, there's a fountain there and that, that shot water into the pool. So you would hear um, sort of the bubbling all around you. And then at the, the exterior side of the pool, there are also um, grotesques that spout water into the deep end. So a lot of water, a lot of water happening in the grotto space. Indeed. Yes, uh, which is part of the conservation issues, right? Uh, water is the enemy in conservation. Yeah, it's it's integral to uh, so essential to the experience of this space. It's a real challenge. Yes, indeed. So we there's a question we get all the time, and this one comes from Yama on Instagram. Uh, so just asking, has anyone ever used the pool? And the answer to that would be, we we're sure that they did, although we don't have any real archival images that show anyone in that pool actually using it. Um, you know, it's been rumored that Daring only went into the pool once, but yeah, we don't know that for sure. Um, you know, we one thing, though we don't typically allow people to go into the grotto area because, you know, it's, it's fairly fragile. Um, we did have an uh, instance where we did need to do conservation on the, the actual pool itself and not just the grotto. And so it was completely drained. And this was in 2017. We actually um, had a contemporary arts program in, in which there was, um, you know, those there were um, musicians in the space, and they had a little concert for folks who were sitting in the pool area. So it has been used, and uh, from that perspective, but no swimmers. So, uh, Lauren, one of the questions that we had also was: uh, Is it a saltwater or a freshwater pool? As far as I know, historically, it was a saltwater pool, historically. Currently, it is freshwater, and it's treated um, 
chemically and also with an ozone filter. Okay. And another question that we had um, was, was it, you know, what is the, the context of pools in these kind of grand mansions back from the 1890s to 1920s? Was this a common thing? Yes, absolutely. Very common for Gilded Age estates to incorporate a swimming pool into their design. Um, in colder climates, many of those pools were actually uh, indoor, indoor swimming pools. So yes, it, I think it was a status symbol. Okay. okay. And actually to go back to the salt or freshwater question too, I should mention, I, I think the pool itself, I think the pool itself was salt water, although it was built over a spring. Um, and so that gave uh, the construction team a real challenge trying to dig out, excavate uh, the space for the pool because it just kept filling up with water. Um, so just an, another interesting factoid. Awesome. So we just want to um, reemphasize that we do have a lot of complex challenges in conserving uh, the components of this guy. It's a very large estate. It's got um, lots of history, but also lots of issues being by the bay, um, having water in the space. There are fountains literally everywhere uh, you know, on the estate. So we need your help in helping to conserve those. Um, you know, we, we can't do it all alone. We, uh, we actually need support for these various projects. As Lauren mentioned, with the grotto itself, it's very complex, long-term strategy in terms of conservative conserving these things. So I just want to um, play for a moment uh, um, a message from one of our board members, Adam Walnut, about this. Thing. Hi, my name is Adam Wallman, and I am a board member here at the Skya Museum of Gardens. The sky is where Miami's past, present, and future collide. The sky inspires us all in so many ways. This house holds numerous treasures, most still actually waiting to be rediscovered. Our city is growing, our sea level is actually growing, our pollution, unfortunately, is growing, and so thus our challenges to preserve this museum and gardens is growing. The sky needs your support. And as the sky expands its historical, horticultural, agricultural, and climate change educational programming, our goal is to harvest the inspiration of our city's future leaders and to nourish our community with the possible. The sky is more than just a house and a garden. It is a bellwether. There is a magic at the sky that cannot be quantified. But to support the magic, we have indeed quantified it. So please consider a gift to Vizcaya that will allow this ever-present monument to us as a city thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, uh, so we do have a website, a web page uh, that would, you know, if you're interested in donating, uh, you can go to this page and find out the various ways to donate to Vizcaya. It's projects, and um, also we wanted to let everyone know that we're open again. Uh, it's to a limited degree, but uh, we're allowing folks to come into the grounds and experience the gardens, which I, um, many, many folks say that's probably one of their favorite parts of the sky. The, the formal gardens, which are um, you know, great, they're a very restorative experience, and, and we've got nice weather lately, so if you want to experience the gardens, we've got acres and acres of gardens that you can come and visit. So right now, we've got a um, discounted price of twelve dollars for adults so um you can purchase the purchase those online all right the gardens will be open from monday through thursday or thursday through uh monday 9 30 a.m to 4 30 p.m and uh, we've got actually extended hours on this friday uh, may 22nd from 9 30 to 7 30 p.m um, the main house is going to be closed for the time being. Uh, we're evaluating when it's going to be the appropriate time to reopen the main house, but um, you know, we'll stay in contact with you. In the meantime, stay connected with Vizcaya. Um, you know, come experience the gardens, and you know, perhaps if you've been to Vizcaya before, you focused on the main house. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to see a different part of Vizcaya and um, actually have a very restful experience as well. Get some sunshine be able to walk around, and I know that's one thing that we've all missed. So if you want to visit, go to thesky.org slash welcome, and uh, you can buy tickets there. 
We appreciate you being with us. Um, Lauren, as always, it, it was a pleasure to uh, see you again. You know, um, one of my favorite people, one of my favorite Vizcaya folks, and also just a heck of a conservative. Um, again, we really miss you here and uh, look forward to seeing you again. Maybe we'll do another one of these live streams where we go a little bit geekier on the topic of con con conservation at Vizcaya. Thank you, Jeff. I miss you guys so much. Vizcaya is absolutely, hands down, one of the most special places on planet Earth. Absolutely. And I miss it tremendously. So I really appreciate the chance to participate. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.